thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is the title. Um, uh, now diagrams are everywhere. And everyday reasoning, explaining, discovering. Uh, and of course, they play a special role in spatial domain, like maps. Uh, what's interesting about maps is that um, there are some aspects of it are spatially supposed to be more or less like the real uh, space, whereas other aspects are, uh, they, don't, they don't have the status. They're somewhat arbitrary. They are, you can think of them as kind of symbolic uh, in their own terms. And some aspects of maps are also <laughs> geometrically accurate, whereas other aspects are only topologically accurate. So it's a fairly compli complicated uh, uh, representation. Uh, and we sort of take it for granted. Uh, and as a, uh, people who are experienced with map reading, we know what uh, features of map to take seriously as analogical representations and what features of the representation we are supposed to be, uh, not, uh, not take it as a, as a serious spatial representation, right? Um, and also, by, again, pie charts, graphs, um, bar charts, tables, uh, organization charts, scatter diagrams, even things like space, you know, tables, they look like mostly letters and numbers, but to, to the extent that spatial location plays an important role, uh, they have this feature of diagrammatic uh, uh, thing in them, okay? Uh, uh, also in everyday reasoning, when an Euler diagrams, people use it uh, for simple reasoning and uh, uh, there are also things like proof of the sum of the first n natural numbers. How many people have seen this proof? I'm just curious. Uh, the first n natural numbers, the sum is, uh, you know, 1 plus 2 plus 3 to up to n is n times n plus 1 over 2. Um, that's something actually, when you use something like this, basically you lay them like this in this triangular form, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, right, in this thing. And then you put this, uh, revert it and put it there, it looks like a square. For n equal to 5, you can see it is 5 times 6, but it's only half of it, so it is 15. And now most people can actually imagine it because n is a general number. No diagram can actually represent n. Uh, it can represent 5, it can represent 6, right? So, but mentally we are able to combine the what aspects of it are pictorially serious, and then we introduce additional symbolic uh, elements in the reasoning and for example, people will say, well, this looks like it is uh, uh, n plus, uh, sorry, uh, if it is n, it is n times n plus 1 over 2, and then mentally they can do induction to finish up the process for the general n, right? right. So it's actually quite a surprisingly complicated reasoning takes place. Uh, you can tell it to anybody. I mean, a high school child, uh, person can understand this. You don't have to be particularly sophisticated in uh, mathematics. Uh, diagrams in uh, geometry theorem proving, right? I don't know, have, have you heard of uh, Gellertner's uh, computer program? In the late 50s and early 60s, uh, David Gellertner wrote a computer program to prove uh, uh, Euclidean theorem by, by computer, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, he did some interesting things in it, but what most remarkable was uh, the computer itself drew diagrams, so to speak, okay? And uh, what uh, the, uh, the, he concluded that what role did the diagrams play? Uh, because it's a computer program doing things, right? In humans, what role does the diagram play? Because when we try to prove theorems in geometry, so he tried to mimic that. It turned out the major role diagrams play is to tell us what is possible, not what is true. Okay, and when you, uh, and uh, uh, diagrams will reject, for example, you could, well, I'll show later on that, uh, I'll tell later on that uh, diagrams cannot represent inconsistent information. Whereas ab uh, abstractly symbolic representations of diagrammatic axioms, you can imagine all kinds of possibilities. And Gellertner showed something like uh, the pruning of the search space, but not by a factor of 10% or 20%, but by a factor of 300. It's uh, just the diagrams pr pr produced enough constraints on the theorem prover that uh, many theorems could be proved within some reasonable time. Uh, similarly, science and engineering are full of diagrams for supporting reasoning. 
uh, everyday reasoning. For example, John is richer than Bill. Uh, Bill is richer than Stu. Is John richer or poorer than Stu? And many people might draw a little a dot. John is the dot. They put John to the left of Bill, Bill to the left of Stu. And visually, then you pick up the relationship. John is to the left of Stu. And since richer is the uh, is, uh, uh, represent, uh, left is representing uh, the rich relationship, you pick up John is uh, richer than Stu. Uh, this is a fairly, comp uh, fairly simple but everyday reasoning. Uh, and simple diagrams are very useful. And there are also diagrams in the mind uh, subject to memory limitations. Uh, many problems can be solved with the mental diagram. For example, that John Bill's Stu example. Uh, you know, if I didn't give you a paper, okay, you can still uh, create a little mental diagram and to the subject of limitations of memory, because I, you won't be able to do it with 15 uh, individuals, but you'll be able to do it for three or four or five individuals, okay? So subject to memory limitation, um, there are, uh, you can have diagrams in the mind that help you with, uh, with, uh, with reasoning. And as, as we shall see with graphs, even when using external diagrams, mental diagrams and operations on them are often called for. So uh, even with external diagrams, making use of them to solve problems requires mental operations that are not in the diagram itself. So um, the issue of mental images has been a contentious topic in psychology and philosophy for many years. Uh, I think the fundamental thing even 30, 40 years ago people raised was, how can you have a diagram inside your head uh, because there is no eye to see it? Okay, so, uh, and uh, it was like, you know, quite an interesting discussion. They're still somewhat open-ended. The Spilishan, for example, is well known for raising questions about the existence of mental images. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that uh, this is a live issue in uh, psychology. Now, uh, the, uh, diagrams, in order to understand why they are useful, or why they can be problematic, um, the, uh, the, basically what happens in a diagram is you see, represent a situation in a diagram. Some of the consequences of this information are already in the diagram. Okay, you don't have to, for example, in this example, uh, John, that John, uh, the dot John is to the left of Stu, is, it's not something you have to infer. It's already there in the, I mean, you, you may have to pick it up. If you don't have the right kind of perception, perceptual system, it's going to be hard for you to pick it up. But, uh, but uh, the information is already there, okay? Uh, unless the other one, John is richer than Bill, Bill is richer than Stu, that information is actually, you will have to uh, additionally do the work to get that information, okay? Um, this property has been called free ride property of diagrams. Okay, you get a free ride. It's, another day. it's already there. So, uh, Shimojima, in, uh, in property of a diagrammatic system, the ability to represent emergent relation as a result of putting two dots on the screen, many other relationships automatically emerge, right? And uh, so the diagram, to the extent that they are useful, okay, this free ride property is one of the reasons they are very helpful. Uh, similarly, for example, if I have a road going through a, a, a path going through a park, it has intersection points that are created, which are often useful in road planning, for example. So uh, relationships as well as objects are already there that for you to pick up. Obtaining this information is relatively low cost for a system if already equipped with appropriate perceptual capability. The reason why a lot of early AI programs did not have diagrammatic reasoning as part of seriously because they were doing mostly you know, inside the computer software and uh, in order to even do simple things, they have to have a full-fledged you know, machine with a perceptual system. And for any given problem, it was just too much work to do. Okay, so that's why it took a long time for AI to actually start getting involved with uh, diagrams. Now, uh, I was talking about the, about the properties of diagram. The next property, two other properties that are important, one is autoconsistency. It is not possible to represent inconsistent information in a diagram, unlike in a symbolic representation. Okay, in other words, because there is a model right there, for example, in the previous case, if I told you uh, John is uh, richer than Bill, and somewhere I had also said Bill is richer than John, 
you'll have to go through some inference to find it is creating a contradiction, okay, whereas it's impossible to represent it in a diagram. So it produces constraints in a way that, uh, that uh, certain kinds of inconsistent information cannot be, uh, and then there's something a de a derivative meaning potential. In other words, for example, in the case of diagram, if I said, uh, how many people are richer than Stu? Okay, in this case, you just count. Okay, so in the, some additional things also are often available, which are again hard to do for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, the corresponding symbolic reasoning system. However, diagrams are not a panacea. Not every problem has a useful diagrammatic representation. Otherwise, you know, there will be no need to do any kind of other forms of reasoning. Especially, they're very poor in representing ambiguity, disjunction, generalization, and, and uh, things of that sort. Okay, uh, so diagrams have downsides too. Over specificity, for example, in this case, we cannot conclude that Bill is about twice as rich as Stu as John is to Bill, right? I mean, that's true in the model. So whenever you're using diagrams, any user of diagrams has to be careful about what uh, information that is present in the diagram is intended to be taken seriously, and it can get complicated and you can make mistakes, okay? So uh, all these phenomena have been rigorously discussed in a recent book by Shimojima. Uh, by the way, at the end, I have a whole bunch of references, so you can take a look at it. Now what I'm going to do, the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the directions of research in this area, okay, so that you can pursue them as you're interested. Uh, what is a diagram? Uh, uh, what's diagrammatic as opposed to symbolic? Uh, basically, consider this, these two, this, uh, but it was the, how do I do the, um, the top one? The top one, right? Yeah. Mm. Okay, I don't see it. All right, so consider the, the uh, this versus this. I mean, they all look to me like a um, bunch of dots on a piece of paper, or at least on a screen, right? They all look like I gotta use my perception to figure one, each, one, uh, each one out, right? Uh, but, um, and uh, whereas here, some aspects seem to be particularly, um, perception gets different kinds of information out of them than in that one, okay? So figuring out or characterizing what makes diagrams, uh, diagrams. No, oh, sorry, okay. Uh, so uh, in one of the papers that I referenced, uh, I develop a framework in which diagrammaticity is a kind of spatial homomorphism to aspects of the domain that is being represented. Uh, homomorphism means sort of some kind of analog structure, an analog structure. Uh, essentially what it says is the causal structure of the physical medium makes certain consequences automatically be present because if you have a cause, the physics of the medium ensures the presence of the effect. But just like, for example, if a, a is to the left of B, and B is to the left of C, okay, A is to the left of C is a consequence of the physicality of the physical space. Okay, so that is, uh, and so when we play this thing in which we take the physical uh, causal structure of the physical medium, and then make use of it to draw inferences to make the information become available, that's a kind of analog repre an analogical representation of which spatial representations or a diagram are a special case. Okay, another set of issues. Um, that is actually not uncommon that in, in, in everyday reasoning, people do not simply do one kind of reason. When they use diagram, they go through some abstract reasoning steps, and then at some point they may look at a particular diagram, get some inference, and then move on further. You know, here, typical use of diagrams involves this complicated uh, interlacing of uh, somewhat more abstract reasoning with particular uh, information extraction from particular diagrams. Okay, and uh, so typically it's, I call it a specific proof technique that may be called model-based generalization is used. It, uh, the thing goes something like this, is that you're reasoning abstractly S1, then you go to S2, and then you come to S3, you're unclear. You don't have enough information in your abstract model, okay? 
So you may actually create a little physical model. An, a, an architect might actually build a little, draw a little diagram. Or a chemist might actually mix a couple of chemicals. See, oh, yes. And then, so basically what, is, what he or she is doing is to create an instance of the situation. And if you're an expert in your domain, you know what kinds of instances you can create so that they're not mis going to mislead you, okay? And then using that, appropriately generalizing, because you know as an expert in your domain, you know you have warrant for generalization, and then pick up and continue the general propositional reasoning. So this is a, not an uncommon form of reasoning in everyday, both everyday reasoning as well as professional reasoning. And then there's a, these are famous people, Bob Weiss and Echemendi, over the last um, several years, they have built a program uh, in which they're developing what one may call diagrammatic logic. Uh, but essentially, if you, you have seen pro proofs of, uh, of uh, Pythagorean theorem, which, is, which consists of a series of uh, diagrams, right? And often, usually, you say in English or Latin or whatever your language is, say something so that what aspects of the diagram are supposed to be relevant. And what Barwitz and Echemendi want to do, even to drop those uh, uh, annotations in language, but uh, is there a way of uh, representing or uh, treating individual diagrams as general propositions, okay, in a way so that you can write re rewrite rules so that a sequence of diagrams can constitute a rigorous proof, okay? It's an actually interesting uh, collection of work and uh, several of his students are working on geometry and many other Venn, Venn diagrams and uh, 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 anyway, so that's an important uh, area of research. Uh, then another area, another important area of research in diagrams is what makes for good diagrams? I mean, there are some diagrams which are actually misleading. Okay, and instead of helping you understand, they confuse you, right? And uh, you, uh, many, you, many of you might have heard of Tufti's books. How many people have seen Tufti's books by, uh, he's written uh, two famous books, uh, and uh, what do you, he shows a wonderful book actually, in which he um, lists and shows you diagrams which are uh, not simply visually beautiful, because that's not the point of diagrams, Okay, they, that they are very perspicuous with respect to, they make relevant information perspicuous, immediately available, easy to get, okay? Uh, and, uh, uh, and in fact, many diagrams are very poorly drawn, especially in every uh, uh, news magazines. They throw color, all kinds of things in it to make it look pretty, but that's not the point of a diagram, okay? Uh, and then uh, related to uh, the, what makes a good diagram, or uh, how do you evaluate diagrams for efficient information presentation? So for example, cognitive modeling of interaction with diagrams, there's some work by me and Peebles and many others. Okay, this is just illustrative references for you to follow up on. And then this is, uh, the, uh, this is my work, at least this is the direction, uh, modeling the use of diagrams in problem solving. Uh, again, the underlying model is that a typical problem solver uh, does, when, whenever he or she uses diagrams, uh, it's really a combination of uh, symbolic reasoning with more general knowledge with particular uses of diagrams for particular purposes. And so it's, uh, it's really a both, uh, both percep perception is used to get information as well as abstract reasoning is involved, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, so, in my work, our work, our group's work, particularly deals with how uh, diagrams, operations on symbolic representations can be interlaced with operations on diagram in a goal-driven way. Uh, how many people have heard of SOAR and ACTAR? Okay, those are cognitive, I, mean, I won't have a lot of time to get into the details of what they are, but I hope to give you a feeling for what they are, just a little bit. So uh, they are, um, that will be my, uh, Okay, before I do that, I just want to sort of take a little branch and uh, contrast uh, a, a traditional view of thinking with a new view of uh, somewhat an uh, augmented view of thinking. Uh, so in the canonical view, um, the thinking machine, which humans are, I suppose, uh, is, entertains a series of thoughts. And if you're a problem solver, the series of thoughts are generated in a goal-driven way, so that thoughts lead to the solution. Ultimately, you are able to thought, which produces a solution to the problem. Okay, 
So it's in this story, tart is something like a sentence in natural language. Okay, so the, I mean, you know, on AB, this is the sort of block A and block B. Uh, when, the, when you're trying to write programs to do planning, okay, this is a common, this is what they call the blocks world, it's called the E. coli of AI, okay, in which, uh, in which uh, you show, uh, you exercise and develop uh, thinking programs, a reasoning program, to see how well they do on these blocks world problems, okay. Uh, this is the language of thought hypothesis. Uh, essentially is that, uh, uh, is that underlying our thinking is uh, a representation which is close to natural language, which has similar structure to it, and typically they are uh, predicate symbolic representations. And in this story, the ontology is the world consists of individuals, which are properties, and there exist relations be between properties of individuals, and you represent your knowledge in terms of, uh, in symbolic expressions that describe the, your knowledge of the world. And uh, this particular way with the so-called predicate symbolic representation doesn't commit you to logic approaches in AI by which you think of thinking as, uh, uh, you know, deductive reasoning or whatever. You know, it's just a very general notion of underlying representation of thinking. So in this story, uh, mind the one on the right hand uh, thing is that is memory. Uh, so basically there is the external world and the agent has perceptual systems and uh, perceptual systems produce information to the agent and they typically are in the form of propositions or predicate symbolic representations so that if an agent is looking at a block A on top of block B in the world inside his head is on something equivalent to on a B. A block A, block B, on a B. Okay, so the world produces information. The perceptual system produces information from the world and uh, goes into the agent's uh, memory or uh, short-term memory. And uh, the agent also has long-term memory, which is knowledge, procedural knowledge. Again, they're in the form of pro various kinds of uh, rules expressed in some kind of a predicate symbolic representation. Okay, and the problem solver has goals and a little machine that uh, takes the current uh, uh, goal, uh, takes information from the world, and brings information from long-term memory that is relevant to the current goal, okay, and applies the knowledge to try to move the problem state forward, and at that point there may be, new, you haven't achieved your goal yet, but the problem state has changed. Now that may produce additional knowledge from memory, and in this way the agent keeps applying knowledge and getting information from the world, and in a goal-driven way, the agent proceeds to achieve the goal, okay? And part of the way of achieving the goal is action on the world. At various points, you might say, oh, put B inside the box, okay? So this is a sort of basic story, but the machine, thinking machine itself, is set of, uh, is, represent, is representationally the predicate symbolic system, okay? So interaction of the world takes place by taking a knowledge of the world from perception in the form of predicate symbolic expressions and generating such expressions about actions to take that are then executed by motor systems. Now, now in reality though, when you look at the phenomenologically, uh, perception delivers more than symbols. Uh, phenomenologically thought as not only a propositional content, but perceptual and kinesthetic content. By which I mean, for example, when we uh, look at um, some things, then not only do we get information about who is in front of me, okay, bench, chair, names of people, but I also experience the world perceptually. I have a perceptual, for example, uh, if you look at uh, fame, uh, some of the famous uh, sculptures of Henry Moore, okay, you're not merely uh, uh, getting the name of the sculpture but you're also experiencing it as a shape. Similarly, when you're listening to music, okay, otherwise only one person can go to a concert and you can just tell the other person a set of propositions about what went on. You know what I mean, the, 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 the perceptual experience is part of our, uh, of uh, seeing the world or experiencing the world. Um, so similarly, this kind of perceptual experience can also be supported by imagination. 
In fact, that's typically what happens is that both the real world information as well as imagination together produce a composite internal representation, which I'm going to talk about. So, but even with, uh, sorry, sorry, for some examples here, um, consider, look at that, can, can A fit into B? You're not allowed to go there and move, move A, right? But how many people, what do you think? Can A fit into B? Right? Now, how did you do that? There is, so, so there is your experience, you're imagining um, a sequence of moves, and then finally you actually, in your mind's eye, somehow, you have the equivalent of seeing A inside B, okay? And then you conclude, yes, A can fit in B. Or consider, for example, uh, if I told you, that estimating the ratio of the length, if you, if, you, if you have to estimate a ratio of the lengths of two curves, it's complicated actually because they're not straight lines, okay? But most of us would give a good old call, we'll, we'll give a, we'll try. We'll move the, thing, the left one on top of the lower one and try to mentally locate the end point and then move once more, okay? We may be wrong, we won't get the exact answer, but often we do things of that sort. This is an example, uh, or for, for example, in the third case, uh, so imagine there's no yellow, uh, yellow curve. If I asked you there is a way of getting from uh, left red point to the right le uh, red point without um, intersecting with that uh, blue uh, uh, little circle, okay, we can actually imagine, we try to imagine there is a way of going from A to B in a certain way, right? All these are examples that show that in real problem solving, uh, <coughs> we not only have perceptual experiences by, from the external world, but we also uh, modify those perceptual experiences with imagination operations, which together produce a new internal perceptual structure, which has certain properties. And this, this continues the same thing. This is all, uh, uh, for example, the superimposition. This uh, Simkin in 1987 identified a set of internal mental operations by which uh, uh, these kinds of activities are done in understanding graphs. So the basic idea is that, is that a composite internal configuration of objects, some corresponding to external representation, some from imagination, to which then relational perceptions can be applied. For example, when you move that little uh, region A into little region B, you apply some kind of an internal perception operation to decide A was fully inside B, right? That's why you decided it could be done, okay? You can't do it all the time. For example, I can give you two cases in which you won't be able to do it unless you actually cut out those regions and move them, right? But in many cases, we can. So, uh, and sometimes you can actually do problem solving without external representation at all. Like I can give you a simple problem, like if ima imagine moving a step forward, uh, moving a step to the right, and move a step back. Where are you with respect to the starting point? Many people imagine uh, some kind of a goal, a goal post, soccer goal post like thing, right? And then conclude they are one step to the right. So, in, uh, so the imagination then, in this story is uh, uh, imagistic and multimodal. It's not simply visual. Um, Beethoven is said to have composed a symphony after he became deaf. And you know, that means he was actually imagining uh, the music that was coming out. Um, uh, often, in, it's not simply perceptual, it's also kinesthetic. We can decide if we can go through a passage by imagining if we can contort our bodies to the way required. You say, no, I don't think I can bend my body to that degree, you know, by standing outside. Or looking on a design diagram, the mouse buttons feel like they're too far apart for comfort. Okay, think things of that by looking at a diagram. Okay, so here, so the original story is a little modified here, in which uh, we still have the external world, and now perception is in two parts. There is a part of perception uh, which is completely cognitively impenetrable. We don't get access to it, okay? But there is also each perceptual modality delivers an internal perceptual representation which is actually accessible to the agent cognitively, okay? And uh, that internal structure 
can be built both from outside as well as from imagination, from memory. So we can create complex internal structures over which we can do perception, certain kind of perception. Uh, and uh, uh, in this story, this is the, so thinking here is viewed as uh, multimodal, okay, where uh, operators, not simply on symbolic representation, but perceptual operators can, off, can be applied to move the state of thought forward. And memory is multimodal too. Okay, now, so, uh, so there are two or three things which can be said. One is diagrams are just a diagram. And in this story I'm talking about diagrams are an example of a more uh, complex story about a thinking machine which is actually multimodal in nature. Okay, so in this one here, if you want to build that kind of a machine, we need the tractable uh, domain. And diagrams are an excellent domain in that way. They are much simpler. Okay, they are also practically useful. So uh, the, if you're interested in cognitive architecture, diagrams are a good first step to see how to augment uh, uh, traditional symbolic architectures into doing these kinds of um, uh, perceptual processing. Not uh, for simply getting information from the world, but as a way of helping you think as part of the thinking machine. Here, perception actually plays a role in thinking. Okay, so this is the, uh, 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 how much time I have? Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, the central idea, central um, part of our system is something uh, we call DRS, which is for diagrammatic representation system. Um, this may be a little, um, uh, tricky to get what I'm getting at, so let me try it. And if you please ask me any questions if you have at this point. Uh, so a diagram is a configuration of diagrammatic objects, each of which is a point, curve, or a region. So okay, diagrams are, again, uh, they're out there, they are, uh, uh, they are, okay, you see there are point, there, there could be a point object, a curve object, or a region object. And they have dual representation. The each object has a symbol, so that you can treat it as a regular good old symbol in the symbolic representation sense. But each object also has a spatial internal representation. A curve, you know where the curve actually goes, what the actual physical uh, 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 specification of the curve is. Similarly for the region, similarly for the point. So simultaneously, they are both symbols that can be moved around and manipulated, like Turing symbol, but they also can support perceptual experience as a point, as a location, as a curve, or as a region. And, uh, and also points and curves and regions, and curves and regions may be identified as distinguished objects. Like for example, uh, the endpoints of, uh, of that curve, you may for some reason choose to focus on it, and so that becomes a point. Okay, so they, again, they have this uh, dual, uh, uh, dual role to play. It is not a, a DRS, the, this is not an intensity array. It is, it is, a pre it is already interpreted. Figure ground distinction has already been made, so that you're not seeing it as an image. You're seeing it as a spatially distributed collection of spatial objects. Okay, so if you see it, if you do a figure ground uh, uh, thing on, in one way, then uh, there is another way of seeing it, DRS won't be able to do that. that for that, you need external representation again, okay? Because it's well known, certain kinds of perception are not possible with mental images. So DRS corresponds to the agent's perceptual experience after a figure ground organization is already made. The array is already interpreted as a spatial configuration of spatially extended objects. Uh, it, is more, it, it, is, it is more abstract than a physical diagram because consider a map. In a map, a road might, uh, might have a certain thickness. There may be three types of thicknesses on, on a map. Okay, one for uh, uh, superhighways, one for uh, uh, local streets, you know, the, the thickness is not intended to represent the exact actual thickness of the road. Okay, but they're only, inter they're, they're, it's, it's like a symbol actually, except that it's, it's a visual symbol, right? Um, uh, but in DRS, if a road in a map is intended to be a curve, 
it is not the thickness is not represented instead the information given by the thickness as a highway it then becomes a symbolic annotation to the to the curve okay so in that sense it's more abstract that is what the agent sees the map of the curve as uh, curves as i said curves as having no thickness in drs as regions and physical diagrams mark corresponding to symbolic annotation do not have a spatial specification in drs for example if i have uh, 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 route 10 or montreal on a map uh, that is not that doesn't belong to the drs on the spatial side so that point will be will have a space a symbolic annotation called Montreal, but no, the, all the physicality, spatiality associated with M O N T R E A L won't be there, because that's it, 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 the intent of that representation on a map is not its spatiality, but simply naming it. The DRS representation can combine elements objects from external representation and imagination and keep track of which is which okay this is where for example talking about moving the region a go into region b right that requires as you're moving uh, knowing that the final a inside the composite diagram uh, in which a is inside b is not really an outside world okay uh, but that is a, that is a thing Im imaginary diagrams you've created in, in your head DRS can also represent and keep track of gestalt abstractions. Uh, and now, perception operations on objects and not on intensity array. For example, certain kinds of percep perceptual operations can be done, such as, like I said, left off, inside. Uh, so similarly, certain kind of actions can be done, move, move inside, and that kind of stuff. But you can't, as I said, you cannot reperceive it. Okay, because psychologically it is well known, certain kinds of operations are not possible, perceptual operations are not possible on internal representation. And this now, uh, uh, the system that we built has perception operators, spatial properties of objects, qualitative length of a curve, uh, that a curve is a straight line, region or a triangle, etc. Emergent object identification, when two roads intersect, the fact that there is an intersection between them, okay, can be picked out visually, and the perceptual operator will do that. Uh, emergent relationships, similarly longer, inside, touches, left off, subsumption relations in which uh, segment A is part of, uh, is, a, uh, uh, is a part of uh, segment B, or segment AB. Uh, angular relations. So there's a selection of perceptual operators depending upon how much closely you want to model the human system. You can make them more human-like or you can make them more uh, uh, computationally powerful. Action operators. Create or transform objects satisfying properties of relation. For example, when we uh, uh, say, say point, uh, draw a point to the left of a region, or when you try to, in the example where we try to see if uh, region A can fit inside uh, region B, uh, the action routine has to be able to move it in, in the head and see, uh, according, setting some constraints on it. Okay? Uh, curve, draw me a curve such that it connects points A and B and avoid region R. In that example where I asked you, is there a path from uh, one red dot to the other red dot, that also avoids all the regions, including the sensor region, okay? That's what the kind of thing your mental uh, uh, perception could do. Uh, both uh, PRs and ARs, the perceptual uh, uh, routines and action routines, are domain independent and open-ended. Open okay, so now, okay, so, um, this is the, um, the point where I'm going to sort of say a little bit about how the diagrammatic, the DRS representation is used to augment uh, a well-known uh, cognitive architecture, symbolic cognitive architecture called uh, uh, SOAR. Okay. Um, SOAR and ACTAR are very similar. Uh, both are uh, cognitive architectures which are committed to the following idea, okay? The agent, uh, let me see if I have a diagram, okay. 
yeah, uh, so the agent has, the agent's internal state has a working memory, a goal, uh, uh, and a current state. A problem space is uh, a set of states that are implied so that if you are in a particular state, and if you apply certain operators to change the state, and you keep applying operators, what you get is uh, a search space. Uh, an operator that transforms the state by some action. For example, if I give you the, uh, some kind of a co collection of blocks in which uh, block B is on top of block A and uh, block C is on top of block B, and then I say, make me a, a thing in which uh, uh, A uh, is on top of B and B is on top of C, okay? We kind of imagine applying operators of various kinds and then finally come up with a plan to put these things together, right? So uh, this is the sort of very simple, any of you have studied any kind of basic problem solving architectures in AI would know this is sort of a, a sort of fairly fundamental, uh, simple thing actually, okay? And LTM, long term memory is a storehouse of knowledge in the form of rules. Essentially what the, what the machine does is it has a goal, it has a current state, which uh, including the state of the world, okay? And then it's uh, basically it matches the current state and the goal to its long-term memory. At that point, long-term memory may have information about if this, 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 then this, you might try this. So long-term memory comes out. So now there's a piece of some action you could take, okay? And that action either can be applied or it cannot be applied until something else changes in the world, okay? So it can produce sub goals. As a result of it, the agent then, by making use of long-term memory, uh, knowledge in long-term memory, the agent keeps creating sub goals until the sub goal can be achieved, and, and then additionally other goals can be achieved, and over time, the agent uh, completes the problem solving process. Okay, it's a repeated application of uh, long knowledge and long-term memory to make progress in the problem space. So, in the, uh, so all problem solving activity is formulated as the selection and application of operators to your state to achieve some goal. So repeated application of relevant knowledge from long-term memory in response to the current problem state produces a search tree in a problem space because problem solving in this view is searching in a set of possibilities. Uh, and learning by chunking, many of you, I don't know how many people know about learning, there is a very particularly elegant way by which SOAR can learn by uh, storing the results of uh, previous searches in a way the next time in a similar situation, it doesn't have to go through uh, the full search space. So by SOAR is our version of SOAR where a diagrammatic component has been added along with uh, diagrammatic operators. So uh, working memory, the symbolic, in this case, for example, the simple case in which uh, is, uh, there are three blocks, uh, A is on top of B, B on top of C, um, the uh, symbolic component will typically traditionally have block A, block B, block C, on A, B, on B, C, right? There will also, in using the DRS, now there's a diagrammatic component. So at any given point, uh, for example, in this case, figuring out using the symbolic component that A is above C requires a couple of cycles of reasoning. Whereas, by looking at the DRS along with the appropriate uh, perceptual, perceptual operator, that A over C is directly available for the uh, perceiver. The idea is that at any given point, the system has a multiplicity of operators uh, to move forward, it opportunistically, whichever operator helps it move forward in the problem solving space, it would do it. So in this case, if one of the sub goals is to see if A is on top of C, instead of reasoning on the left hand side, it will pick it up on the right hand side. So ways in which cognitive state may change during goal directed problem solving in BISOR, the usual symbolic operator application, Application of an internal perception operator to an image component, just like, for example, once you once a perception sees that A is above uh, C, it can just throw that in as a piece of symbolic knowledge on the left-hand side. 
creation, modification of imagistic components in response to changes in the symbolic part or in response to sub goals. So the system might also imagine future states in which you are imagining putting, taking A out of that one. So the DRS would change and it's in your mental, uh, 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 in your uh, working memory. Uh, intermodal evocation, namely what some changes on the left hand side and the symbolic part may produce uh, 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 corresponding perceptions. And changes in the perceptual part may produce additional information propositionally. Okay, so that uh, new, each state might change, st each component might change state as a result of something happening in one state. Change in also, change in external representation, word, by motor action, with the result in change in cognitive state. So that there are lots of suddenly the cognitive state in the, uh, in the agent can move forward by many more processes now than in the purely symbolic uh, thing. Whichever is helpful to move forward in a goal-directed way is now available to the agent. So here's a little example problem solving um, in which uh, this is, uh, there are, uh, uh, the situation is there is an area of interest there are three regions which are no-go regions. I don't, this doesn't work here. Okay, there are three regions which are no-go regions. There are uh, three red things. The left one is uh, T1, T2, and T3. I'll show you what they are. So T3 uh, is the sighting of a new vehicle. It is from uh, some kind of intelligence analysis problem. Uh, so a T1 a system already has knowledge of two vehicles, T1 and T2. Uh, of the same type in the area of interest, their locations and times of sightings. This is the symbolic version, basically a little table showing T1 is such and such a thing and it was on such and such a date, it was located in such and such a location, right? Now T3, uh, okay, so now what you want to do is to decide whether T3 is a completely new vehicle or is it T1 maybe moved since we lo somebody last saw T1, or uh, is it T2? Okay, so now the diagrammatic reasoning system uh, is tasked with uh, saying, are there pa paths, uh, it is now focusing on T1, is there a way T1 could have gotten to where T3 is right now? Okay, the diagrammatic reasoning system comes up with two possible paths and says yes, okay? Uh, so identify routes that T1 and T2 might have taken to get to T3, that's a sub-goal. So first, uh, diagrammatic action operator is applied and two routes are generated for each vehicle and added to DRS. So system ru rules out the longer route in each K. This is in the case of T1. The system now does very traditional symbolic reasoning and then says, nope, the longer route is not possible because given its maximum speed, I know. And given the time that has elapsed, okay, that could not be, that, that, if, that is, if T3 is T1, it could not be that it took the longer path. It would, it would have to take the shorter, the other path, okay? And similarly for the other two, okay? Are you with me? It's just a simple, you know, a, I'm, all I'm showing here is the combination of how symbolic reasoning and goal-directed uh, diagrammatic reasoning is working, okay? Uh, now, uh, the system now has uh, 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 information about sensor uh, databases. Okay, there are apparently two sensor uh, re, uh, fields in the, in the area of interest. Um, now, notice the bottom path. So the system asks, uh, did, uh, did, the, did either of the sensor regions report the sighting of uh, any vehicle, because if any vehicle had passed through the sensor field, there would be record that the sensor field would have reported it, okay? Now the system comes back and says, nope, there is no record of any uh, uh, sensor field uh, 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 locating or uh, sensing a vehicle passing through. Are you with me here? Yeah? Okay. So. Uh, that now the question is, well, uh, is that could the route be modified so as to avoid the sensor, right? Similar to the question, uh, can I go from A to B while avoiding the region? 
And now the diagrammatic reasoning part uh, says, yes, in fact, there is a way uh, it can get around the sensor field. So that would explain that the, uh, why this sensor field did not report the presence of that or the passing of this vehicle. Similarly, you do something similar for the other one, uh, but now it turns out that there is no way that path could be modified to avoid the sensor field, right? So the system abductively concludes that uh, that uh, uh, T1, uh, that T1 took that route to get to T3 is the best explanation of uh, everything, uh, all the data that's currently available. Okay, could the road be, okay. I think you, you, see, you, you get the point, right? Uh, so, um, so this, I'm just illustrating the way uh, the problem solving system uh, in a goal directed way combines the symbolic uh, reasoning component with a diagrammatic reasoning component to move, move forward in solving a problem. And BISOR has been applied for many as some other task of cognitive modeling, uh, geographical recalls, that they're all fairly well known, well -known uh, geographical reasoning uh, tasks. And the, our BISOR model can explain many of the uh, uh, known phenomena uh, in that uh, area. Okay, so now I want to go back to the larger claim uh, about multimodal uh, cognitive architecture. Um, there's a, a, at least two other work uh, that I think is relevant. One is Damasio, uh, he is fairly uh, well-known neuroscientist. Um, he has written a couple of books, and I think for him, the idea that uh, brain representations are fundamentally coordinated multimodal images is uh, sort of fairly fundamental claim that uh, Damasio makes. And Barcelo uh, is, uh, again, a well-known psychologist who's been working for many years now on the idea of perceptual symbol system. You can think of DRS as an instance of a perceptual symbol system specialized for diagrammatic representation. Notice they're symbol systems because uh, they, uh, they have symbolic, you can, you can, for example, if I ask you to imagine uh, an elephant eating a banana, I don't think you've seen it before, have you? Anybody seen an elephant eating a banana? Right? But you could probably imagine it to whatever, some degree, right? So essentially you are now the, the symbol, the elephant, banana eating all evoked various things but you can put them together in your head in some way. So the idea is that uh, just like symbolic systems allow you to compose information, okay, there's something like this, uh, a DRS-like system, allows you to compose, which has been one of the big objections to the idea of mental images, is uh, the uh, uh, real you know, mental images can be composed, but there is no way actual images can be composed because either you have a picture in your head of uh, elephant eating a banana or you don't have a picture in your head of elephant eating a banana, okay? Uh, and uh, the, uh, the DRS is a kind of an, is an example of a perceptual symbol system which has both the symbolic feel that we all uh, come to uh, love uh, in traditional symbolic representation in AI and cognitive science, okay? But it also has so the other features of supporting perceptual imagination. So uh, this, this view, that the multimodal view I out, outlined, it treats predicate symbolic components as just another component with equal status with inner perceptual and kinesthetic components. In other words, yes, we are, we are reasoning, rational, uh, uh, symbolically thinking animals, okay? But all, all this is built on top of an underlying perceptual kinesthetic machinery, okay, which often has equal status in our thinking. Uh, okay, it's not simply, the, the, again, the point is, the point of, at least a, a part of the point of having perceptual and kinesthetic system is not simply to get information from the external world. It is not simply to act on the external world. It is actually to use, to imagine the external world and to, and to think. So this is the key uh, distinction uh, that I want to emphasize. Symbolic rules of inference are uh, just a small part of the information extraction operators in, uh, in the conceptual part. 
Uh, so this is actually a story which gives still a lot of respect for uh, uh, human thinking uh, and thinking machine and their symbolic component because that's what the generality, the systematicity uh, and the open-endedness of linguistically supported uh, thinking is undeniable, okay, but if you don't want to throw the, uh, you don't want to throw the, the basic perceptual kinesthetic uh, foundation on which higher level thinking is built. Okay, so let me stop right here.